So I iterate from there to there. I get the value of the matrix uh, from the value array, but now I have to do something a little bit nastier than I usually do. I need indirect addressing, because I have to look up this number from the index array and use that as a subscript to go to the X array to figure out where it is. And so this indirection is what makes this much less predictable and much harder to parallelize than standard dense matrix vector multiply, because I don't know where it is until I get there. So let's talk about how to parallelize this a little bit. And so what's the simplest thing you could imagine doing? Suppose I had four processors. I'm going to take my sparse matrix and I'll give you know, the first processor the first quarter of the rows and the second processor the next quarter of the rows. And I will say that uh, it also would be natural to say each processor owns one quarter of the entries of Y and one quarter of the entries of X. That seems like a natural thing to do. Uh, and, but you know, is that always necessarily going to be a good idea? You know, what if there are not very many non-zeros up here and lots and lots of non-zeros down there. This will not be a load balance problem. So what I'd like to do is figure out how to assign rows to each of these four processors. So what I need to do is take all the row indices, you know, one through n, and break them up into p, or four in this case, disjoint pieces. What do I want to optimize? I want to load balance and I want to minimize communication, right? The usual stuff. So. Um, so, and what each processor is going to be responsible for is doing the dot product of the rows it owns with the entries of X and storing that entry in Y. So that, that's what it's going to be doing. And so what I'd like to do is, you know, figure out how to do that to, you know, so that everybody does the same amount of work. And if, the thing is, if processor one only owns that subset of X, but it needs some data from another processor, there's where the communication comes from. So I want to make sure that each processor owns as much of the data locally that it needs to touch on X. So let's say, what would the ideal sparse matrix look like that would require, it would be perfectly load balanced and require no communication? You know, so this is not going to you know, be the typical matrix, but it sort of gives us a hint of, of what we want to get close to. So the best case would be block diagonal. So I, suppose I had um, five processors and my matrix looked like this. Everybody would have just a, all the local data. It would own that subset of X, that subset of Y. All the communication would be completely local. I wouldn't, this guy doesn't need, doesn't need to get any entries of X from anybody else because all they're going to get multiplied by is zero. And then it updates the locally stored entries of Y. And since all of these are you know, equal size, N over five by N over five, you know, it's perfectly load balanced. Obviously, not every sparse matrix looks like that. What I, but what, so what I want to do is reorder the rows and columns of my matrix so that it looks as much like this as possible. Right? So I want to sort of figure out what's the right way to restructure it all to make that happen. So just to summarize my goals, I want to load balance. So everybody, so, so what's the load? If I have to do a dot product, let me go back here, of this row and that, uh, in that vector, it's the number of non-zeros in that row. That's my work. So if I'm assigned you know, these rows, how much work do I do? It's the number of non-zeros in all those rows. So I'd like to balance that everybody gets about an equal number of non-zeros. If I want to balance memory, it's exactly the same thing, because each non-zero is a storage, so that's the same problem. I also want to minimize how much I have to communicate. And in this picture, it was perfect, because I, the only data I needed was local to me, right? The green guy gets multiplied by there. I don't have to talk to anybody else. So I'd like to minimize the number of non-zeros out in all of these blocks. I'd like to put as many of them right here in the middle as possible. And then uh, there's all sorts of other optimizations, too, that are you know, analogous to your homework one, where I try to pack things together for cache purposes. But let me just concentrate on these two. So, so I, I'm, I think I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Graphs and sparse matrices are just two different languages for the exact same mathematical thing. So I'm going to bounce back and forth between that language all the time. Here's a sparse matrix. Here's its graph. And so in this case, there's one row and one column uh, for each vertex here, so you know, one through six. And uh, there's an edge in the graph for every non-zero in the matrix. So in this case, it's a symmetric matrix. So one, four is non-zero, and four, one is non-zero. And that's green, and that corresponds to the green edge right there. So these are just different data. You know, it's exactly the same mathematics, and so I'll use those ideas going back all the time. And so what I want to do is partition, 
you know, break this matrix up, and that's going to be the same thing as partitioning that graph. So let me just show you the picture. So suppose that I partition the matrix by breaking it up into the, the first two rows, the next two rows, the next two rows. What does that correspond to in the graph partitioning problem? I've grouped together rows and columns one and two. That means I'm partitioning this graph so that one and two belong to the same partition. I put rows three and four together, so those are one partition in my graph. And I put rows five and six together, so that's another partition. And the, so that's sort of you know, a natural relationship between the two. So now, what do I want to do? I want to load balance and I want to minimize communication. So what's the load balance? How many non-zeros are there in each row here? So I have one, two, three, four, five. What does that correspond to? It's the number of edges that one and two are connected to. One, two, three, four. Four, five, and oh, plus these guys. Okay, it all adds up, <laughs> right? So I've, I've lo so each edge here corresponds to either one, or, you know, you know, to one floating point operation that needs to be done. So I just count the number of edges. What is the communication? So what does pro what does what do I need to get one multiplied by? I need uh, I need x sub four and I need x sub five. So one is connected to x sub four and x sub five. Those two edges from this node to that node are, represent the communication. That's what I want to minimize, the number of edges connecting one to another. So that's exactly the same thing as the graph partitioning problem that I mentioned before. Break these up into, into you know, disjoint sets where I have as few edges crossing from one to the other as possible and where I have about an equal amount of work to do. Okay, so just to, I'm almost done here, really. So what are the common problems? There's load balancing, and that's, you know, if in the static case, that's graph partitioning. We've seen that several times now, and we'll see it again several times during the semester. We'll have a whole lecture on it. Um, and, you know, if your problem changes dynamically, I might have to adjust it from time to time, but, you know, it's a graph partitioning problem. Linear algebra came up over and over again. Sparse matrix vector multiplies, solving sparse systems of linear equations, and particle methods. Now, my last slide, I can't remember if, if you've been shown this one before, but a few years ago, there was something, uh, so have you, have you discussed the seven dwarfs yet? Okay, so a number of years ago, our colleague Phil Colella, who's a computational scientist at LBL, looked at all of the high-performance computing problems in the Department of Energy, and he said, what do they have in common? And he realized there were only seven kernels that appeared over and over again, and if you could only you know, implement those seven kernels really, really fast, you could solve all the high-performance computing problems in the Department of Energy. So high-performance computing, what were the kernels? It's these red bars. Dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, FFTs, spectral methods, n-body codes, MapReduce, that's embarrassing parallelism, and then something called operations on structured grids, like where you're average with your north, south, east, and west neighbors, and then unstructured grids. So we just did all of these guys. We just saw examples where all these come up. These two come up in PDEs, and I'll talk about those next time. So, so this is all you need to make high-performance computing run fast. Now, after Phil did this, this was a number of years ago, a bunch of Berkeley faculty and students got together and said, okay, that's good enough for high-performance computing, but what about the rest of Silicon Valley? You know, games and machine learning and, and you know, finance and all of that stuff. And so we got together and we spent a year looking at a whole bunch of codes that people wanted to parallelize, you know, from all different commercial walks of life and asked what, what are the, the kernels that come up there over and over over again, it turned out all of those original seven dwarfs came up, and there were only six more that, that everything could be broken down into. And since there were 13, and there were 13 dwarfs in The Hobbit, we could still call them the 13 dwarfs. But you know, that was sort of an accident. So, so now we call them patterns or motifs, just you know, because maybe next year we'll discover another. And what this heat plot says is how important, for example, uh, you know, uh, FFTs are in games. And it shows up red, that means they're really important in games. Uh, orange means it's a little less important, and you know, green means a little bit. And so what were the other kernels, and we'll have lectures on these too later in the semester, finite state machines, uh, combinational logic, graph algorithms, um, uh, backtrack uh, branch and bound search, graphical models. So, you know, things that will, you know, be familiar by the end of the semester. But so, <clears throat> so that's the end of today. Next time we'll do PDEs and see where structured and unstructured grids come up.